Hello, my name is Simon Double and welcome to Inside the Rails, a monthly podcast for horse racing enthusiasts everywhere. And as ever, I'm joined by my co-host Phil Boyle from BG Racing. And it's normally at this point that I ask Phil how he is. I will ask him how he is, but I think he's been feeling none too clever recently. And I'm not referring to his IQ. How are you doing, Phil? Oh, thanks, Simon. Yeah, that's uh, that's lovely. Yeah, not too great, but uh, battling through. Fortunately, my symptoms don't seem to be COVID and they don't seem to be affecting my uh, my sort of chest and my voice. So I thought I'd join you for the podcast, but... Um, your tones sound very dulcet to me, Phil. So. <laughs> Having a few problems this week, but I'm sure we'll be over them soon. Excellent. And um, yeah, it's been good to see. We've had some extra downloads this month. I don't know if you've noticed that. We now have a Twitter account as well. So I have. Excellent. Well done on that. Yeah, we've been posting to that on a regular basis. So um, yeah, it'd be good to say to people, if you can um, follow the podcast tell your friends and, and make sure you now engage with us on Twitter, um, sending us messages through there. We'll come to Simon and I so we can reply to anything that anybody wants to know through there. We, we certainly will. Now, look, I saw you were at Leicester this week, and I'll ask you about that in a moment, but uh, it'll be great to welcome another great industry guest to Inside the Rails. And this month, we're very fortunate to be joined by Rod Street, who is Chief Executive of Great British Racing. We were all enthralled by Champions Day at Ascot recently, which Rod is heavily involved with. And indeed, Great British Racing organised the recently very successful National Racehorse Week. Uh, It'll be great to find out about Rod and his role in both events, won't it, Phil? It certainly will. Looking forward to that, Simon. Now, I did just mention that you were at Leicester earlier in the week, and I saw that you'd been very well looked after by Diana Wilder and her team at Leicester. Yeah, far too beautiful. One of my two horses ran there. We had 12 owners there on the day, and Diana was really brilliant in helping me to sort out extra badges. They laid on a really good set of food in the restaurant for their owners, and we had a very pleasant afternoon. Far too beautiful was only sixth, but she was only beating the head and the nose for fourth. Okay. So it was a much better run than she's had recently. She moved right in the straight. You know, she she headed over onto the far rail, and we found a small muscular issue afterwards, which we think will benefit from some time off. So we're going to give her a winter holiday now. Uh, nothing, nothing serious. The muscular issue, you know, fairly minor. Hopefully, no, fairly minor. The chiropractor had a look and just said the the best thing for her would be just to have a little bit of rest. Okay, I'd tell you these horses are looked after well, aren't they? They have more physios and chiropractors and osteopaths <laughs> than all of us put together, I think. But, uh, they certainly uh, do. I, I hope she enjoys her holiday anyway. Now, a couple of weeks ago, you were even further afield at Foss Lass, a course I've still not had the pleasure of going to yet. Yeah, that's um, that was with Dynamic Kate, who finished third that day. I can confirm Foss Lass is a long way away. Okay. It, okay. it doesn't. It doesn't seem right that a, a course in South Wales ends up taking four and a half hours to get to, which is about the same wow. time that you can get to North Wales. You know, it's 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 a long way across. But yeah, we had a nice day there. Dynamic Kate ran a nice race. Uh, we thought that the leaders would go too fast and fall back to her in the closing stages, but they didn't really stop, which meant that she was only able to finish third. But she's now been second, third, fourth and third since her last wind operation. So she's getting competitive every time. Unfortunately, soon after the race, she came uh, when they tried to load her up onto the box to go home. She was actually quite lame. Um, And uh, since we've got her home, once all the the swelling had gone down, it was in her her left hind leg. But we've now found that she's got a hairline fracture of the fet log just above her hoof there. So she had an operation to have that pinned earlier in the week, which sounds serious, but um, it went well. Did it go well? Did it go okay? Yeah, it was it was it was good, and and she'll only be back in the spring, which is no bad thing because she likes faster ground. She wouldn't be one for the winter months anyway, so um, you know, no real loss of time with her there. And what about you, Simon? Did I see that you were hanging out in the Royal Box at Kempton this month? I did. I was very fortunate to have the Royal Box because HRH wasn't attending Kempton on that particular Tuesday night. So thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think it's ma'am. I think it's ma'am as in jam, not mom as in alarm. But anyway, enough of the Royal Protocols. Uh, we had sharp distinction making his debut in what looked quite a warm novice over seven furlongs, 14 runners. And he came sixth, only beaten two and three quarter lengths. I paid, oh, what was it, 22,000 guineas for him last year as a yearling. 
and the favourite uh, owned by Godolphin was €330,000 as a foal. And we were only just behind that. It didn't actually win, but we were we were just a little bit behind that and uh, very pleased with the run. So uh, some very happy owners. And yes, I can certainly recommend the uh, the Royal Box. Well, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how many more invites you'll get when the Queen's actually there, Simon, but um, make use of it while she's not. In fact, the Queen's not been too well recently, has she? It's kept her away from engagements, so uh, we wish her a speedy recovery. Now, look away from our own runners, Phil. There's been a lot going on recently, hasn't there, with a nail-biting finish to the Jockeys' Championship. It went right to the wire between Ushin Murphy and William Buick. They were riding virtually everything they could get their hands on during those last few days. I have to say, of course, just to remind listeners, Ashin won by two, uh, getting his third title in a row, which is a great achievement. But I have to say, it was obviously very arduous, really, and, and uh, physically draining for both of them. But I thought particularly Ashin looked uh, looked a little bit drawn. But um, Tony Hind is William Buick's agent, and he did a sterling job allowing William to, to really put up a great fight right to the end. And he is actually somebody that we'd like to get on as a guest, he did actually say that he would come on inside the rails, but he'd have to wait till, uh, till the end of the championship. So I hope that William Buick coming second hasn't dampened his enthusiasm uh, for joining inside the rails. Yeah, that'll be really interesting. Um, I don't think Jockey's Agents are a, a very well-known area of the industry. Dave Roberts used to hit the headlines when he booked rides for Tony McCoy, amongst others, obviously. But it would be great to get an insight into the role of the agents. He'd be a, he'd be a great guest. And speaking of guests, our last one was Sam Bullard, who gave us a bit of an insight into breeding. Well, this month we've seen the yearling sales at Tattersall's, where a lot of those breeders are selling their horses into racing. I wasn't able to go this year in the end, but the trade looked pretty strong, and I know you were there. The strength of the trade was probably boosted by several overseas buyers, despite us losing big players like Prince Khalid and Sheikh Hamdan in the last year who had both normally been buyers here but the prices still looked really strong is that is that what you felt when you were there Simon? Very much so Phil and of course Tattersalls were delighted because trade was very strong they divide these yearling sales into books one two three and four I, I tend to go to book three because my pockets aren't deep enough to, to go <laughs> buying up books one and two um, but the Tattersalls were delighted with trade being very high. And in fact, they said at book three, that actually it wasn't just the foreign investors. They said that trade from British and Irish owners was very strong as well. Really hard work to get the right horse for the right money. I was underbid on at least two occasions. But I did eventually strike, as they say. I got a lovely colt for 25,000 guineas. Really pleased with him. And I often think these things turn out for the best, don't they? So the horses I wasn't able to get in the end, I was quite pleased about. So, uh, yeah, bought a nice horse. He was the only Burrettino in the whole sale. You might remember Burrettino um, winning the Coventry Stakes for Godolphin, Phil. Mm -hmm. And uh, Burrettino, here's a question for you. Do you know what it means, where Burrettino comes from? Absolutely no idea. I haven't researched it in the way that you obviously have. <laughs> well, I have to confess, uh, listeners, I did research it. Apparently, Burrettino was named after a puppet with a wooden nose in a Tolstoy novel along the lines of Pinocchio. So there you go. Um, anyway, enough of going down literary memory lane. Um, I'm delighted to say that the horse is going to go with Amy Murphy to be trained at Newmarket. So I'm adding Amy Murphy to Dean Ivory. So so that'll be something to really look forward to. And in fact, the horse at the moment is chilling out at Childrickbury Stud because it's quite difficult for these yearlings, quite exhausting for them when they're at the sales and when they're being prepared for the sales. So I like the yearlings to chill out for a couple of months beforehand. So he's over at St Albans. Went and saw him the other day, did a photo shoot with him. He was really well behaved. And uh, he'll be going to Amy's probably just before Christmas. So the merits of that, Simon, is that uh, if you appear as a guest on Inside the Rails, then you get a horse sent to you later, is that? We'll have trainers queuing up for an appearance. Well, well, yeah, obviously the proviso is you've got to be a trainer, but yes, it's, it's, it it seems that way, doesn't it? So uh, she was a really good guest, wasn't she, Amy? So, she certainly uh, was. It, it's nice to repay her in this way. Of course, that was all away from the race course, but there's been plenty of action on the track as well. Champions Day mentioned earlier on that Rod Street was very involved in that. And of course, we will hear about that later. But Champions Day at Ascot was brilliant as ever, Phil, wasn't it? Um, for me, the highlight, I mean, you know, they're all cracking races, aren't they? For me, probably the highlight was Baid winning the QE2. What about you, Phil? 
Yeah, I was I was surprised to see Sealyway beat Adair and Mishriff in the Champion Stakes, but then again, he was only just behind Adair in the oak, in the arc, so you couldn't really call that a surprise. Of course, as you mentioned, Bayed against Palace Pier was great to watch, and even the handicap at the end of the card, uh, Al Dari that won that, looks sure to be listed or group class next season. So yeah, it's a cracking day, wasn't it? He he was very well punted, Al Dari, wasn't he? Very well supported. He he was, yeah. Now, of course, it's not just been flat racing this month. Uh, I know you were back at Cheltenham watching the start of the jump season. Anything that caught your eye there? Any performances to note? Yeah, several, really. Third time Lucky beat some well-regarded rivals on his chase debut. He looks likely to be pretty decent. He ran on the Friday at Cheltenham. On the Saturday, before midnight, put in one of the best rounds of jumping I've seen in ages yeah. to win the two-mile handicap chase. He he didn't touch a twig, as they say. He uh, it absolutely you know jumped like a stag round the course. And on a personal note, I was delighted to see my trainer, Neil Mulholland, have a winner with an old favourite Kansas City Chief who was ridden by amateur jockey Victoria Malzard, who was... Still on cloud nine when she rode far too beautiful for me at Leicester <laughs> on Monday. But my horse to follow from the meeting was not one of the winners. Okay. The bumper at the end of the at the end of the card always seems to have a few really good horses in it. And there was one in there called Top Dog, who would have won in my opinion, but he, he went right across to the left on the run in. He actually bumped into the third on the run in. Okay. And th- I mean, I wouldn't want to say threw the race away, but I think it probably cost him the race. So he would be my horse to follow from the meeting. I think he could turn out to be top class. So your top horse to follow is Top Dog. We'll look out for him, definitely. Absolutely. <laughs> now, back to the flat. We have the Breeders' Cup coming up soon at Del Mar in California. Are there any are there any European runners you're looking forward to seeing in particular? It'd be great to see if Mishriff can bounce back from the champion stakes. He seems to be a... Sometimes a better horse on his travels than he is at home. So I hope he does go there and um, can bounce back from that. I hope that Mother Earth goes in the mile, as I think she was actually quite unlucky last time and could still be a player in that race, and she'll probably be quite a nice price as well. And, of course, we've got um, two Kevin Ryan possible runners in the turf sprint, Emiratiana and Glass Slippers. Kevin probably wouldn't be a trainer that the US public will have heard of, so they could be a little bit overpriced as well, I would I would suspect. And on a personal note, I would love to see Love line up somewhere, mm-hmm. if you excuse the pun. Uh, she deserves a bit of a swan song. She hasn't, hasn't been quite as good this year as she has been in previous seasons, but I'd like to see her run. And I know you think a lot of Ordaria, so it'd be nice to see her take her chance as well. Yeah, well, I suppose that comes partly from a financial point of view. I've won a couple of quid on Odaria, uh, you know, over the years or over the last couple of years. And it would be nice to see her uh, for owner Alison Swinburne um, defend the Phillies and Mayor's turf that she won last year. She's currently about a nine to two shot for that. And also uh, current betting as we record this podcast, Phil, though some of the horses you mentioned, Mother Earth is round about an eight to one shot. And indeed, Emirati Anna is about eight to one, and Glass Slippers nine to one. So there you go. There's some up to date prices for those horses that uh, that you fancy. I always think with those ones, Simon, it's worth looking at the American uh, prices on the day because yeah, absolutely, that's all based upon the money on the track, yep. and a lot of those European runners are not punted by the American players. So you can sometimes get a few extra points by following the American market rather than the UK ones. Well, I'm delighted to say, Phil, that we've got Rod Street on the line. Welcome, Rod. How are you? I'm very well indeed, thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me onto your podcast. I'm pleased to be here. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. Uh, we're really looking forward to finding out about your your two roles, because you have two hats in racing, don't you? One is Chief Executive of Great British Racing, and the other is Chief Executive of British Champion Series Limited. But before we find out more about those two roles... How did you get into racing? What's your story? It's a rather circuitous route, really. And um, I I, I first got into racing in 1994. I started life at Utoxeter Racecourse as an assistant commercial manager. But preceding that and and after leaving school in the the mid-80s, I spent the first chunk of my life in entertainment and travel. Back in the day, um, the very distant past, I was an entertainer at holiday camps 
which um, I can thank my my mum's late partner for, really, effectively my my stepdad. Were you a red coat or a yellow coat or something like that? I was a blue coat. A blue coat, okay. Yeah, I was I was a blue coat back in the day when Ladbrokes owned holiday camps. They later sold them to Haven, 